And we are live with today's guest, Spidey of Spidey Hypnosis and Spidey Magic, whose name I believe is Bedros Akalian. Did wow. I mutilate it that badly? No, love it. That was amazing. Okay, so I'll uh, stick to Spidey now. I slid, <laughs> got it right in the first round, and we'll go to this. Um, I met Spidey tangentially through seeing him on a video with Chase Hughes. I'm always following what behavior panels doing, etc. And Spidey is a well world renowned performer. I mean, you've been on with Penn and Teller, um, Rachel Ray, not necessarily the same level, but <laughs> very different, but very cool things. So yeah. how are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to connect with you guys and chat. Dude, I'm stoked. And I, what I love is you are all over the map, pretty similar to Chase. Like if I'm going to run an analogy, you and Chase have a bit of that, um, except Chase doesn't do the magic. So, right. So yeah. So we both sort of fell in love with psychology, but I guess I I enjoy the spotlight a little more. And so I discovered it through performance and him more through, you know, his military training and that stuff. So it kind of branched out into different directions, but with a lot of overlap. Yeah. And I've had um, Henrik Fexius on. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He's out of Sweden. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He wrote yeah. a book on, on the yeah. overlap between what we do and what, yeah. Great stuff. Yep. Good guy. Um, really cool guest. And, and what I love about you guys is you're fitting my little theory of everything being on a spectrum. Yeah. So everything from a car salesman to a cult leader is on a spectrum to me. Yeah. that, that It's funny because there was a time where I had this big conspiracy that Chase actually has a cult he hasn't told anyone about because he's got every ingredient to be an excellent cult leader. So, so yeah, I I'm right there with you. <laughs> yes, he does. Um, including, you know what? We should start it. You can call it the tan daddy cult. I love it. I love it. I'm in. I, I'd like to be, I'd like to be towards the top of that pyramid though. Oh, but, but you, you probably are on a ground, ground so. level. <laughs> okay. So to get an idea of who you are um, first, um, I know you wrote about it on Facebook recently, but if you could tell everybody uh, why Spidey, is it because your name's hard to say or? No. Uh, well, there's two reasons why Spidey, but what, I, I mean, the, the main thing is when I was in high school, well, I was a teenager, I, I worked at a day camp and we had to have like cute names for the kids. And I chose Spidey because I was always a comic book fan. Mm -hmm. And it was, and it was like sort of like a trending sort of thing at that time. And uh, I picked Spidey, it just came to mind. And the very first shows that I did for people was for the families or kids of that camp. I don't do kids magic anymore. It's been probably over 20 years. I haven't, but mm -hmm. I, I started by doing uh, kids shows for the kids from that camp. So I had to make business cards that said Spidey because I don't want the kids to know what my real name was. But then other people started calling me and the name just stuck and I couldn't get rid of it. So I just rolled with it. Hey, it works. I mean, you're memorable and everybody says it. So awesome. Um, okay. So you started, when did you start doing um, magic? So magic was always part of my life, but it wasn't always an obsession. Like when I was young, I would, my dad would come back from Vegas with these little tricks that I would sort of learn and then not really do that much a couple of times for my friends. And then when I was a little older, maybe like seven years old, um, there was these things called magic works, little kits. It's a really cool little magic trick. You buy it, you learn it, you do it. And I was always more into like learning the secret than doing the trick. Like a uh, thumb it was tip. Always sort of there. It was always <laughs> part of my life in high school. I knew some card tricks that I would do. Um, I, I was an English speaking uh, kid in, in a mostly French school. So it would help me sort of mm. you know, break that, that sort of wall. Um, and then... I really, really got stung by it when I was a teenager. Um, it's hard for me to know exactly what age, but I was in Vegas with my dad and I kind of saw this uh, guy demonstrating it. You ever go to Vegas, Eric? I've been to Vegas, but I didn't really watch magic and I'm not in love right. with it. Well, so there was these stores in the malls. It wasn't even a magic show. It was these stores in the malls. It was called Houdini's Magic Shop where they would sell entry-level magic mm -hmm. and they would do these demonstrations for everyone. And I saw one. I'm like, what? 
and he, and then he goes, this is you know twenty five ninety nine and this or twenty four ninety nine. This is nineteen ninety nine. Like you could buy like you could buy wizardry. Like that's a thing. I, I guess it never dawned on me. So I bought I bought like everything, and I came back home and I was absolutely obsessed with it. So so when I was a teenager, and that came before my obsession with psychology. I think my obsession with psychology evolved from my love for magic. You know, um, I'm, I'm going to do this a lot because it's my style, but every time I hear something, it pops in my head and makes me think of something else. Um, when you say buying tricks, isn't that something that's done even on the high level of magicians? Like a, a well-named magician, I'm not going to name anybody, but might pay somebody else who is a trick creator uh, much in the same way as some high-level comedians pay people for jokes. Absolutely. So you never stop buying magic. Like even now as a professional, if I want to add something to my arsenal, I have a couple of options. I could hire a consultant to create for me. I've never done that because when it comes to my craft, um, I am quite creative. So I might, I might reach out to some of my friends to help me tweak things, but I've never full on dependent on someone to create for me, but there is still a magic market. So there's magic websites out there and magic shops out there where creators will create a new product uh, and, and put it out there for magicians all over the world to buy. So for example, I recently put out a product called ABC. It's a, uh, it's a effect, a mentalism effect done with flashcards. And it, we put it out early December and it sold out in four days. It was a huge hit. So that's wow. doing really well. Yeah, I'm really, I was really happy to see that. I, I didn't expect that at all. Uh, but so even within the creating of mentalism, which is my, my niche mentalism, um, I do have a good reputation as a creative type and I have been called on other projects to consult. So yeah, absolutely. Even at the highest levels, Penn and Teller, David Copperfield have, well, they, they do have creativity as well. Teller, you know, Penn and Teller are very, very creative, mm -hmm. but they still have consultants and they do hire people to create for them or they see something they like and they buy it and they tweak it, make it their own. So yeah, absolutely. At the highest level. When it, it was making me think of that, um, it sort of makes sense. Like you have people who may be a better performer than they are a creator yeah. and vice versa. Like um, songwriters are still out there and creating the top pop songs in the world for particular artists. And the songwriter is not capable of releasing a song themselves performing at the same level as let's say that, that new, you know, teen sensation or whoever it might be. Right. It depends on your strengths, right? Some guys are really creative and, and their mind thinks of innovation and new ways to do new things. And, uh, and others are just really, really charming on stage. Which, and, and both have their place. It's, it, that has to lead to sometimes some challenging relationships too, I imagine. But um... yeah, it's also, it's also important to note that like no one's a zero on either. Like the people who mm -hmm. create aren't zero at performing. Like they, they can, they can probably, Put together a decent performance and the performers aren't zero at creative they're smart enough to come up with tweaks but it's just not their forte okay and i'm going to be pulling in questions from the chat too um bush of bush has two so i'm going to just roll them into one. First one what is the difference between magic and mentalism and does david blaine do magic or mentalism What's i absolutely other? love that question thank you so much uh, busha busha um wonderful question it's a big part of what i want to talk to you guys about today because because there's so much irony to mentalism and behavior analysis, which we'll get to in a moment, but, but let's talk about magic and mentalism. So you're going to find a lot of different performers who are going to give you different answers to this. Mm -hmm. And my answer has always been the following. So, so a lot of performers are going to tell you mentalism has more of a mental vibe, like connecting with you. It's not, that's not what I think it is. I think the difference between magic and mentalism is the following. I think that if you see a performer do something amazing and your first guess, or the, the, the guess of most audiences is that it's trickery or sleight of hand or deception, it's magic. If most people assume, and they're wrong about this, but they assume it's some sort of capacity to read your body language or your energy or to connect with your thoughts or to influence you with their gestures, it's mentalism. It's, not, it's a mm. wrong guess, but when you get that vibe, that's, mentalism feels more real than magic. It's not. It's as trick-based but it feels a lot more real. Mentalists, people believe mentalists have abilities that we don't. Whereas with magic, people know exactly what it is. It's trickery. That's interesting. So 
I would think, and maybe I'm already wrong, that reading body language and things like that would help you in the manipulation of people for mentalism, like, you know, as obviously much as, hypnosis as much, or whatever. So, so this is where a lot of people get it wrong. Um, yes, the, there is real psychology in performing mentalism in the sense that audience management and certain ways to guide them towards things, but magicians use it as much. So, okay. so that element, that psychology of performing magic and mentalism applies to both crafts. But when you watch a mentalist and we look at you and we tell, so let me give you a really, really great example. And I think this will, is really a clear way to explain it to people. Mm -hmm. So let's look at a classic magic trick. So let's, let's address David Blaine. Uh, does David Blaine do magic or mentalism? He does both. I've seen Blaine do both. So he does certain things that are straight up magic, like the card rises out of the deck. That's magic because nobody's looking at that and thinking that he actually has the brain power to <laughs> move that card. No one. But he also does things where he has people think of something and he knows what they're thinking of and he reveals it in mysterious ways. That's mentalism. Now, let's look at a classic magic trick that I think all of us have seen at least a version of. The magician has somebody pick a card from a shuffled random deck where all the cards mm -hmm. are seen as different. And it goes back into the deck and the magician takes a piece of fruit like a lemon or an orange, cuts it open, and the card is inside. Eric, have you ever seen a version of that? Yeah, yeah, rolled up like a cigarette and rolled up the, like a yeah, cigarette. Yeah, yeah. Classic trick, classic trick. So, card is chosen, fruit is picked up, cut the fruit, open it. Oh my God, the card is inside. Everybody goes nuts. Nobody, nobody in the world looks at that and goes, "Oh my God, this guy is a psychic or he has real abilities." We know it's a trick. Anyone sees that and knows it's a trick. Mm -hmm. Now, now let's dial that back. Let's take one step back from that trick. In order to get the card into the lemon, I think we can all agree that the magician has to know what the card is, right? Sure. Right. So regardless of how or when, the information of the identity of that card has to be known to the magician. Mm -hmm. So let's stop there. Let's say I take just that principle, that from a shuffled regular deck of cards, someone takes one card and somehow I know what that is because I have to to get it inside the lemon. Right. But let's say I just stop there, forget the lemon, and I look at you and I say, Eric, focus on your card. And if it's mm -hmm. a red card, think of it now. And if it's a black card, think of it now. And I tell you what your card is. Well, mm -hmm. now I've used the same exact trick, but instead of it going to the lemon, I've convinced you that I'm using some sort of mind power mm -hmm to know what your card is. And that's what mentalism is. Mentalism stops just short of magic and introduces almost more convincing quote unquote presentation, which I'm, I'm actually against that. I'm against that pseudo presentation that tries to convince people that this is real. I despise that because it, 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 it spreads ignorance. And mm -hmm. so, but, but that's what it is. So now I've convinced people that I have the ability to read their thoughts when I'm using the exact same trick that I used to get inside the card inside the lemon. May I, can I demonstrate something? Oh, right absolutely, now? please. Okay, so I'm gonna back up a little bit like this. So I'm gonna right now use pure trickery. Everything, now, I, I, probably I shouldn't have said that. You know what, I'll wait before I say that part. So I'm gonna back up a little so you guys can see everything here. Let me do this the way a, a mentalist does this in their show. Now, in my show, I have a disclaimer where I often say in my show, what well, you're seeing here is trickery. There's a bit of psychology to it, but it's <laughs> mostly based in tricks. So. Right now, Eric, we're going to do something uh, about uh, our, our happiest thoughts, ha okay. happy memories. Now, Eric, before we do this, nothing is set up. You and I are friends. We've chatted, but you didn't know I was going to do this. Yeah. I didn't tell you at all anything to prepare. No, you have no clue what's about to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very important. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate right now my abilities to persuade your thoughts and to read your body language, okay? So here's what I want you to do. This is all about our happiest thoughts. And Eric, what I want you to do right now is, for me, think of a think of a moment from your life that, that if you were to go back to um, a simple idea, a simple image that makes you really happy. Now, this could be something from your childhood. It's not an elaborate big thing. Maybe one thing, one simple image of something. Maybe it's a gift you once received, or maybe it was like something like you were you were at a landmark and you saw that. Just something that um, makes you really happy. Let me know when you have a thought like that in your mind. Okay. You do? Sure. You have something? Okay. Yeah. Now I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions, but I don't want you to give me any answers here or any details. I just, I just kind of wanna sort of connect with this thought. Um, 
This is from a while ago, like more than a decade ago. Yes. Yeah. And what, as you're thinking about this, there's other people there with you. Yes. Yeah. But one person comes to mind more particularly, right? Sure. Older than you? Mm, I don't know. Oh, you know the okay. That's yeah. okay. That's interesting. But you do have an image of this person. Vaguely, it's been a while. Okay, let me ask you. Do you, then this is without giving me any information about this memory. This person that you're you're seeing in this memory is this a guy or a girl? If you don't mind my asking. Female. Oh, it's a female. Okay. 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 Yeah, I, I have a pretty good idea what this is. I'm going to grab a couple of things here. We'll get back to that. We'll get back to this. Um, this is what's important right now, and this. Um, and Eric, again, we haven't discussed this at all. No. Okay, I'm going to go with this. I'm going to go with this, and I'm going to put that... There. So I've sealed something inside this envelope. I want you to remember, before you uttered a word about what this thing is... I wrote mm -hmm. this down, right, Eric? Sure. It's right there. It's sealed inside this envelope. And even if we're like separated by cameras, this is the reason I got this envelope. This is a big open window so you guys could see I can't get to this. If, if I mm -hmm. were to try to get to that, you, it would be extremely obvious. And if I put it right here, it's in full view at all times. Okay. We'll get back to that. Um, over here, I have a journal with some of my happiest images, Eric. These are all 20 different pages. Each one has something that's happy for me. So this one, you can see the first one is a bird. I love animals. We were talking about this earlier. I have a ton of animals and uh, bird, I have two birds and it's such a happy memory for me. There are 20 pages like this. Eric, I'm gonna influence you in a moment to choose one of these. I'm actually gonna persuade you to choose one of these. But before we go to that, Eric, I wanna ask you to tell us, because I'm committed to this, what was your the memory that you thought of? What was it? Tell everyone right now. Uh, beach at night, North Miami Beach. North Miami Beach. At night. At night. Is that what you said, at night? Yeah, very specifically. Right. Looking no, 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 into yeah, yeah. Night. Think, yeah, That's important. So you're thinking mm -hmm. of North Miami Beach. Now, I don't know if you know this, but I, I guess you might know this. I have, a, I have a condo in North Miami Beach in Sunny Isle, so very, very close to wherever you were in that memory, but that's complete coincidence. I, we didn't talk about my condo earlier or anything like that. Right. right. Okay. Um, North Miami Beach at night. And we mm -hmm. didn't discuss this. Okay. Um, in a moment, you're going to choose one of mine. So we're going to start with the persuasion. I'm going to persuade you to choose this. That's what you're going to choose. I'm going to hold this open like this. You could see this on page one like this is the bird. We already knew that. Sure. Eric, clear your mind completely. Don't think of a number yet because I can't influence that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to snap my fingers. When I do, you're going to name a number from one to 20. Any number in the middle from one to 20, you're just going to pick one out and you're going to say it out loud. One, two, three, say it now. 11. Did that just pop into your mind? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that doesn't mean anything to you, right? No. Okay. So one would have been, we knew it was the bird and two would have been, oh, actually, I want to show you this one at a time. Uh, one would have been the bird. We knew that. And two would have been a baseball. It reminds me of my childhood. Three would have been this. And you could see these are all different. You could have said any one of these, six or seven. You didn't say that. You didn't say eight or nine. That would have been a sushi, my favorite food. Okay. Uh, you didn't say 10 either. I guess this one's self-explanatory. But you said page 11. What's on page 11? Uh, turtle or tortoise? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, very good observation. Uh, it is a, a tortoise because that, that that shell like this. But tortoises are turtles. So so it's a turtle. Um but you could have said any one of these numbers, Eric. Do you feel like that, that was a free choice? I couldn't have influenced that, correct? As far as I know. As far as, <laughs> great answer. When you're dealing with someone like me, that's the right one. So before we even did this, I wrote something down and I said I was gonna persuade you mm -hmm. to choose this. You chose okay. the turtle. I haven't touched this. If I did, you guys would see it. It was on the table the entire time, but that's exactly what I was going for. All right. Pretty crazy, right? Mm -hmm. But that's the persuasion part. I've also told you that I'm a master of reading your body language. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I was channeling my inner mentalist there. And before <laughs> we started, I asked you a couple of questions. I had to connect with a thought. I wrote one thing down, sealed it inside this envelope. And, and I showed this to you. It was, it was here the whole time. And again, if I tried to touch that, I wouldn't be able to because it there's this. Like You would see it. It would, it would look like sure. this. My fingers would go in there and it would be obviously like that. Mm -hmm. All the sleight of hand in the world wouldn't allow me to do this invisibly. It can't be done. But I wrote this down right in front of you before you uttered a word. 
as I tried mm -hmm. to connect with your thought. And what I wrote down, Eric. Nice. Now that one's even more impressive than the uh, second one. The second one could involve a palming, but I didn't sure. palm. You guys can go back and watch the video. There was no palming. There's no switches, okay. nothing. But yes, that you you've got it right. There is a fundamental hard technique to this. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is most mentalists will really commit to the fact that I influenced you to say number eleven. I connected with this memory of North Miami Beach. So. It's, it's, it's difficult for people to know, and that's not at all what it is. I didn't connect with your thought. I, I had no clue what you were thinking of. Mm -hmm. um, so behavior analysis can only get me so far. Behavior sure. analysis can give me little details as to if this is happy or if it's sad or what's going on. And it allows me to know, for example, the fact that I knew that this wasn't a recent memory. I can get mm -hmm. things like that. But to know the details of something like that, no behavior analysis course in the world will ever show you how to look at someone and know by their body language that they think of North Miami beach at night. It can't be done. I, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Nor, nor the Not persuasion. without a plant. <laughs> no. Yeah. And I've studied persuasion my entire life and no amount of persuasion will be able to get you to plant the number 11 in someone's head. It can't be done. So the basis of mentalism is a magic trick. Mm -hmm. um, and without giving away too much, there, there's a lot of similar psychology to what I just did as to getting a card inside an em uh, a, a lemon. Because if you think card, lemon, mm. well, card and the envelope, if you think of that as the lemon, mm. now things start to make sense a little bit. We have the ability to get certain things in certain places. So the basis of the tricks are the same, but mentalists present it differently and therefore create an illusion of mightiness <laughs> in the minds of spectators. All true. And, yeah. and I guess the perspective of it is like, you have to know what the card is in the lemon and then everything else is just figuring out how to match that up from the person. Exactly. And mentalists use a lot of sleight of hand and mentalists use a lot of trickery and mentalists use a lot of, props but you you don't know that they're props the way you know a magician is using a prop because magician's props are big shiny boxes and a mentalist prop might be something as as assuming as a pad of paper yeah mentalism though is especially good for a dinner party i love it for that i love it for that. <laughs> because I, it's cheap right <laughs> well it's not that it's cheap it's that there's an elegance to mentalism that i love but i think that i think mentalist i could see a lot of my subscribers are here what's going on guys joseph is here redstone golem um, awesome. Welcome, guys. And make sure to subscribe to Eric. If you guys are here because of my post, make sure to subscribe to Eric. He's got some great content on psychology on here. He's got some of my favorite um, people out there on the channel as guests. So so make sure to subscribe. But yeah, so so what you're saying, yeah, I love mentals at dinner parties because there's an elegance to it. There's a, there's a nice, but I think it comes at a bigger moral cost if you're going to pursue mentals. And because I think it is our responsibility to tell people this isn't real. There's a lot of mentalists out there who go on convincing people that what they're doing is real psychology. It's not. Now let's go into that a little bit because, uh, you know, the name came up, obviously Darren Brown. Yeah. And I just, you know, dropped the three episodes we did of um, Sirhan Sirhan. Now we're starting to cross some boundaries here when we're talking about hypnosis, hardcore persuasion, and how far we can take things. Now you have um, uh, videos where you've convinced people of different things, and that's going a little beyond a magic trick. I agree. So, so this is where the lines start to get really, really blurry, and it's really hard to explain because most mentalists, most mentalists, don't have any knowledge in actual persuasion mm -hmm. or behavior analysis. But when I was much younger, I realized, first of all, I was, I was pursuing a degree in social psychology, which I completed. But I also realized that, okay, so, so Mr. Mentalist has you pick a card. And then Mr. Mentalist goes, think of your card. Don't say a word out loud. Is it a black card or is it a red card? Oh, notice how he blinked twice when I said black. It's a black card. I always hated that. It's pseudo-psychology. It's nonsense. It's garbage. Right. I wanted my presentation to have reality behind it so that when I said something, like if I said something like, um, notice how you 
touched your face twice as I was talking about this or that. Well, that's real science because when we get stressed or when we're deceptive, we touch our face. So I wanted real things that where my present, I wanted to give something real to my audiences as opposed to just feeding them endless bull. So I studied behavior analysis and I studied persuasion at a very young age because I wanted to have that reality. I didn't realize the irony of this. The fact that studying that will only contribute to the myth that mentalists actually know persuasion and body language because most of them don't. But then you have guys like Darren Brown who actually study that stuff and, and mm -hmm. quite a few other mentalists out there as well who have a good understanding of this. And it's ironic because I could teach someone, I could teach a good actor mentalism in a week. I could give mm -hmm. them a solid mentalism show in a week. Behavior analysis, persuasion takes years to get it right. And even with those years of commitment, you're still not going to be able to look at someone and tell them that they're thinking of North Miami at night, uh, North Miami Beach at night. You're not going to be able to do that. So mm -hmm. you can take the best in the world at behavior analysis, Navarro, Chase Hughes, you name it, the whole behavior panel, put them in a bar and then take a mentalist that I trained with a week of training. Mm -hmm. And the mentalist will be able to convince more people that he can actually persuade their decisions or read their body language than the guys who can actually do it at, at the at the highest level of expertise that I admire way more, infinitely more than mentalists because mm. of the time they put in that craft. It's just less demonstrable. So then you have guys like Darren Brown. Now, I can't talk too much about Darren Brown because it's not up to me to tell you what he's actually doing. No, of course not. But keep in mind that above all things, Darren Brown is a mentalist with knowledge in behavior analysis and persuasion, but that's not his field of study. So that's it. That's all you get on Darren Brown. I have a series <laughs> on my channel. For those of you who are interested, I do a lot of behavior analysis content. I just dropped one today all about Andrew Garfield. So if you guys are Spider-Man fans like I am, he has some really great stuff recently in interviews where some really interesting stuff was happening with behavior. So please go check it out. My channel's weird. It's like a, it's like a flea market because <laughs> There's a bunch of stuff on magic and mentalism because I still cater to that audience a lot. So you guys could go learn completely free. You could learn e some easy to a lot of a little more advanced, but also a lot of really easy tricks you guys could do for your friends and family. Some mentalism stuff to convince them that you can persuade them and read their minds. Go check out my playlist called Easy Tutorials. You guys could learn stuff in minutes that you could do with paper and pen to convince people that you're in their heads. Predict the score of any game. There's a video on my channel that'll teach you a way that you head over to your buddy's house, football, uh, basketball, anything, and you can predict the outcome. A bunch of stuff like that, easy stuff. So, But then there's a bunch of real psychology stuff. I have a lot of behavior analysis and the Andrew Garfield thing I posted today. Guys, please go check it out because when I post the real psychology stuff, I have a bunch of magic fans who won't watch it because they're just there for the tricks. So I need you guys to come represent the psychology <laughs> side. Come on over, please help me, please, and come come over and say we came over from Eric's channel, and I will I will I will love you forever for that. But I and also just, have there's a link in the description, folks. I I have his name highlighted. You just click Spidey Hypnosis there, and it'll. Thank you so you much. I'm really trying to build that, and I would so much appreciate that. But I also have a whole series where I react to clips from the TV show The Mentalist, which was one of my favorite televised shows ever. But it's a double-edged sword because as much as, I, as much as I loved it, the downside was that it painted mentalism under an incorrect light. Con told people that mentalists are good at behavior analysis, are good at persuasion. The character in The Mentalist isn't a mentalist at all. He is a profile. Like, right. And, okay, that show, <laughs> I've got to get my one big complaint about it. Red John. Wah, they wah. wore that stupid line down so hard that it destroyed wah. the show. We stopped watching yeah. it. it, yeah, it was and like, then it turns out, and then and then it turns out that it really wasn't that big of a, like it wasn't a bit like you were expecting it to be like this big thing, and it was like, oh, it was that guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't know. I didn't get that far. It was like yeah, it's, it's, it it's was bad. like revealed finally, and then back, and it was like never mind. Yeah. And that's yeah, that I'm destroyed the show. I'm with you. I'm with you. But the show did a lot of great things and a lot of. Not a lot. It did a lot of great things for mentalism and a couple of things that, because people watch that, when I talk about mentalists, they go, oh, so can you like do all this stuff that Patrick Jane does? I go, yeah, I can. I can, but most mentalists can't. That's all mentalism is. He does a couple of tricks throughout the series and I look at those and some of them are really embellished and some of them are 
kind of likely. Um, so you have a whole series on my channel where it's very educational. Where I break down scenes and I go, this is possible. Here's how this is not possible because of this. So, and I talk a lot about the difference between what we can really do and what we can't, but there's that great irony of like, you could train and learn behavior analysis. And I think that's so much more valuable to you know, cause it gives you real skills. Mm -hmm. I, you know, this, what am I going to do with this in the real world? Go tell people here, hold on to this envelope. Like what, what am I, it's not a real life skill. It's well, I think it is a skill um, for, uh, for persuasion and pushing people to a point you'd have to back it off and make it seem more subtle. I mean, that that's too extreme. And sure. yeah. I'm curious, like we'll throw authors around um, uh, Robert Cialdini. I feel like mentalism in a lot of ways is persuasion in action. Yeah. So, so actually it might be post suasion. <laughs> is it okay? But, but you're setting up an environment so perfectly yeah. That they right. have to respond to that. And uh, back to Darren Brown, I don't know, but that example, um, he has this one example of people who drew these things on the table or, or whatever, and it showed them on the drive there and something was in the window and something was in another window and things like that. And I don't know if that's all BS in of itself to make it look like a more mystical, but I will say that he did set everything up. He controlled the vehicle. He controlled the room. He controlled the environment that they were in the entire time. And that's why persuasion comes to mind is I'm guessing you control the environment around you to force. All I'm going to say is this. I, I really like, I really can't say more than this. Darren Brown is good enough that he could have done that exact same trick. If he had zero control on their drive there. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That's all I can say. But <laughs> okay. always remember, <laughs> mentalists are tricksters. Always remember that. Whenever you see something that's like, wow, like really dead. Let me put it this way. Oh, my God. Chase Hughes is the best in the world. In the world. At persuasion and behavior analysis, as far as I'm concerned. He's the best I know. Hmm. Chase Hughes cannot set up a drive and predict what you are going to draw on a piece of paper at the end of that drive. Can't do it. And well, he's better can. than anyone in the world at that. Mm -hmm. so, so always remember when you see these demonstrations of like, wow, Mentalists are tricksters. Okay, Behavior so analysis is not that demonstrable. So let's circle back again and get into the other side of the Darren Brown and uh, potentially Sirhan Sirhan. And I bring these up specifically because, well, one, it ties over, and two, um, that's Chase Hughes' um, white whale right there too. Sirhan Sirhan, there's definitely some sort of hypnosis Sure. Oh, with listen, guy. with and... everything I'm with everything I'm telling you, I'm not at all. So I haven't even spoken about hypnosis yet. Hypnosis is very mm -hmm. real. And not all mentalists know hypnosis. Right. Some do, there's overlap, but hypnosis is a very real thing. And when I talk about persuasion, I mean persuasion in the sense that I'm gonna move my hands like this and say these words, and because I did this this way, you're gonna draw uh, a dog with a with a ball in its mouth. That doesn't exist. But hypnosis absolutely does. So, yeah. Could Darren Brown hypnotize someone and then have them draw something and he know they're going to? Absolutely. Is Saran Saran evidence that there was hypno hypnotic practices within the government? Absolutely, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, everything I just said has nothing to do with hypnosis, just mentalism. Hypnosis is 100% right. legit. Well, and that's the, and that's a tricky thing because you know we I keep bringing up Darren Brown for a reason just because he's known quantity, and he does know hypnosis, yeah, very obviously, and he does do mentalism and he does combine these and he seems to know the psychology. So, you guys aren't completely dissimilar. No, and world. and so that's where it becomes really tough because if Darren Brown says he studied persuasion, which he has, and he studied behavior analysis, which he has, and he studied hypnosis, which he has, then he does a mentalism trick. You're going to think that the way he did that mentalism trick is all those other things he studied, but it's not. So it's so hard for people to gauge, right? especially in the case where you're looking at someone who has studied all that stuff, 
where the method to these things lies. It's so, and I understand, and I get that. It would be difficult for me too. But that's what I'm telling you guys. When you see something that's really demonstrable and you go, wow, how the hell did he do that? You're probably dealing with a trickster. Interesting. So do you use, and I guess where I'm going with this, do you use the mentalism trickstery to help manipulate or could people do that? Like, you know, you add a little bit of trickery to help um, enhance that hypnosis or enhance this. The, the uh, a little, a little bit for sure. Uh, for example, if I'm going to hypnotize or persuade someone, if I start by showing them just a little mentalism thing, it's going to open up their mind a lot more and have them believe that I have this ability to connect with their thoughts. It'll make my persuasion and my hypnosis much, much easier. The, the, the tricks themselves are not that practical in day-to-day -day influence because at the end of the day, I'm not really influencing your thoughts. Right. I'm creating the illusion that I am the same way a magician creates the illusion that they could levitate or make a coin disappear. Performing mentalists create the illusion that they could persuade you, but it, mm -hmm. there isn't really that much of it in there. So the overlap helps in the sense that yes, it creates credibility, but that's, that's about, that's about where it ends. After that, I have to actually rely on my real psychology abilities. But and let, me, I mean, and let me show you guys. That's powerful. Yeah, please. Let me show you guys something that everybody could participate in right now, all the viewers. And this is something, um, if any of you have uh, kids or teenagers, nephews, nieces, grandchildren, uh, I'm on a series on Netflix, huge success. It's called Brainchild. It's a very mm -hmm. successful show for educational show for teens and, and, and kids. And I'm in there as the psychology guy. Like I teach a lot of the psychology stuff in three episodes. I have one entirely on hypnosis. One yeah, on memory. your memories. One. Yeah, the one on memories. Yeah. Uh, and then there's one on uh, critical thinking. And what you're about to see, you could show, you could share with your family and friends. Uh, and it's in the episode called Thinking. And mm. if you've seen it, just don't don't ruin it for everyone else. I haven't. I saw, I saw the uh, memory one, which I thought you were doing a memory palace, but it wasn't exactly that. It was the peg system, which is quite simpler. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's the same. It's associative remembering. So... This, so what I'm about to show you right now undoes everything I just said because it's not a trick. There's no sleight of hand at all. Um, mm -hmm. And it's called the demonstration with the red cards. So if 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 you know what I'm talking about because you've seen me do this before, don't – because I know a lot of my subscribers are here. Clarissa is here. Oh, okay. Clarissa. Um, <laughs> don't, don't ruin it for everyone. Just shush. So it's called the demonstration with the red cards, and it uses – Two different things. So we have these and we have this, which we'll come back to later. Um, actually, you know what? I'll put this aside. You weren't supposed to, but it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. It won't make much of a difference. So demonstration with the red cards. I'm going to grab a few of these here. Uh, no, we'll just do this. We'll do that. Yeah, I guess this is good. We'll do this. I'll grab one, two. Okay, this is perfect. So I'm going to show you guys these, and I'm going to ask you some questions about them. And just try to remember some details about these cards. I didn't make some anything. I just grabbed them off the face of it. So I'll show them to you like this, and mm -hmm. I want you guys to get a good look at these. Okay. And we're going to start with a very simple question. And Eric, you can participate as well. Um, how many cards am I holding? Five. Five, that's correct. Yeah, if you said five, that's correct. Um, let's try this again. Look at these. Focus on the color of those cards. So cards have two colors, uh, mm -hmm. red ones and black ones. So I'm going to, there you go. Take a good look at them. And mm -hmm. let me look at them as well. Good. And I'm going to give them a mix like this. And uh, I'll ask you guys, uh, Eric, don't answer out loud. Give everyone a chance. How many red cards do I have? Think about that. Eric, do you know? Mm -hmm. How many? Three. 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 Yeah, three. Wonderful. Okay, look at the values or focus on the values a little mm -hmm. bit. Let me ask you, let me fire off uh, two questions here. How many court cards are there? So cards have number cards, like from the two to the 10, and then the court cards, Jack, Queen, King, mm -hmm. and Aces goes back and forth. How many court cards do I have? Eric, do you know? I think it's one. Yeah. And is there a value in there that comes up more than once at all? Six. Right, exactly. So if you guys said one, that's exactly right. There's the King. Is the only court card and the six comes up twice wonderful um now i'm going to change something i'm going to add something and i'm, I'm going to change something here i'm going to add this 
And I'm sure you guys could see how that one is different than the other ones. Sure. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to show them to you like this. Okay. Take a look at that. Mm -hmm. So the card that I added, the one that's different than the rest, the one with the blue back. Mm -hmm. Don't answer it out loud. Give everyone a chance to think about this. What card is it? Don't. Eric, just give it a sec. Mm -hmm. Eric, what is it? It's the uh, Queen of Hearts. Queen, it is the Queen of Hearts. Fantastic. Okay, we're almost done, I swear. Um, just a few more questions here. One more look. How many of these cards are uh, red on the back, on this side? It should be five. Right. So if you all said five, most said five, that one is 100% incorrect. <laughs> There are five blue cards. Now I know, I know I said everything I do is trickery. And I know I've studied sleight of hand my entire life. And I could do something like this with sleight of hand, but I didn't. There was never more than one red card. None of this was sleight of hand. This was entirely psychology. So I'll walk you guys okay. through exactly what happened from the top. First of all, I called this the demonstration with the red cards. Okay. It puts an image of multiple red cards in your mind. I take out a red box. It puts the idea of red backed cards in your mind. I take out the cards and I never, I, you see the back of the top card over here as I take it out. I can even show you the back of some of the cards like this, but I never show you the backs of these cards. That's outside of hand. I'm not doing any switches. You're just seeing the wrong cards. Then I take um, five of them out of which only one is red. And with a series of questions, I get you to focus on the face of these cards. So I keep asking you things about the face. And every time I mix, I just keep that same one, the only red one, in the back like this, and I keep doing this. And I keep reinforcing, yes, you're getting this right. Yes, you're getting this right. So I'm putting you on this yes momentum. Got it, man. Yeah. So, but I just keep showing Like you a this. compliance almost. 100%, foot in the door. Then I take this and I add it, the queen of hearts. I add this here and I say the, the, the key sentence here. I say, I'm sure you could see how that's different. I don't say it. I don't say it's different because it's blue. I say, I'm sure you could see how that's different. Your mind fills in that gap and accepts that it's different because it's blue. Therefore, all these must be red. Mm. It assumes that. I never, I never said it. Now I push it in and I say this. I go, the, the new card, the different one, the one with the blue back. All those are separately true statements. It is mm -hmm. new, it is different because it's new and it does have a blue back. But right. your mind again assumes a correlation. It's different because it has a blue back. I didn't say because. I made two different statements. Your mind assumes causality or correlation between two things that are not correlated. So now your mind is convinced that there are more than one red cards because of all those little things that I did. So now, when I ask this, and I've never had this not work, people say five red back cards. And this is entirely psychology, no sleight of hand whatsoever. And you guys could try this at home and you guys could show it to people on Brainchild, on Netflix. I do this to the camera. And uh, it's just a beautiful demonstration of actual persuasion and actual psychology. And I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> now, how many, um, how many tricks do you have out there that are that way? Or is that just a study of psychology? So, so, so few. And I'm always on the lookout for things like that. It's so rare to find things like that, that you can demonstrate and get that wow factor that is entirely psychology. There's so, so few. I have another one in my mentalist series where you have to follow a, a mint box, which is based on, it's still trickery, but it's based on the psychology of assumptions. But things like this are so it's it's honestly the best one I know. And I and I'm it's so hard to find things like that that are real psychology without the trick part. Well, and it's also like the vision stuff, um, or you or you have the um Yanni or something else, which is actually hearing, or uh the two dresses where some people see green, some that yeah. there's some very interesting vision. Cues. There's and some think... applications to that in mentalism. It's it's a little impractical, but there are, without saying too much, um, there are effects we use that deal with that kind of dual perception type thing. Also, like 
if you look at dual perception, we often use that. Um, I, I guess it's not saying too much if I say something like this. So let's. So so remember earlier you were asking me if a lot of mentalism is persuasion. I said it might be post persuasion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the reason I say that is the following: um, very often magic or mentalism, we late. So we do an effect, and as we recap before the big moment, we change certain things. Mm. We in in that recall. So for example, I can give you a really good example. I have a I have a tattoo on my wrist of um, of the seven of spades, right? And I have a trick that I do for people where look like they a choose a seven of spades and it turns out that it's on my wrist. And before mm. we do that, I show my hands empty like this. So meaning you can't see my wrist. Right. So at the end, before I show them this the seven of spades, I say, now remember, before we started, I showed you my hands and my arms were completely empty. I didn't. But when I say that, it puts a different memory in their head because manipulating memory is really, really easy. Our memory know, is That's right. why eyewitnesses suck. Eyewitnesses suck. Eyewitnesses <laughs> completely suck. Our memory is a flawed system. It remembers what will guarantee our survival, but that doesn't mean that it remembers the best details. It's not accurate. It's built for survival, not accuracy. So mm -hmm. when in mentalism, I often do that. I'll recap what happened, but I'll add... Like, for example, you might write something down and I'll take it and set it aside. And later I'll say, you wrote something down. I never touched it. So that's the memory that people leave with. Like, no, 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 bro. He never touched that. So I, we use that a lot in, in magic and mentalism to where the recap or the retelling of what happened shifts the memory of what happened and makes it seem and, and in your memory a lot more fair than it actually was. So there that, that – but that, again, that's not – only mentalists, magicians also do that. Now, how long did it take you? I mean, because that's not something you just do overnight. Now, I know you mentioned you can get somebody to do it in a week, but your presentation is so important yeah. to have that that casual confidence to say, yeah, remember, showed you my hands, da da da, da and, you know, where you're almost throwing it away, where you're not saying, remember, you remember, right? Yeah, yeah right. Remember, remember that. Remember that. Remember, you're touching remember, 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 yeah, you know, like it, like it, your your bad um um confession person. It's like, oh, uh, I went in at three in the morning, but no. Um, how did you go about? Is it just a matter you just kept practicing over and over and so, over? To so we learned this. We we learned that that very early on with magic. So let me give you a really good example of something. Um. Let me grab something that's the appropriate size here so I can show you this. You know what, uh, Eric? I, I'm going to go grab like a, a, a silver dollar. So tell tell oh. your audience a joke or something or do some sort of <laughs> – Or something. I'll, some I'll some sort of plug, now. some sort of – I don't know. Keep them busy for literally 20 seconds. Awesome. Look at that. Susan Woodcarver, you are a hero, member of my locals. Thank you very, very, very much. Um. Let me see. Do, 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 do. Some people are talking about Satanists. I don't think there's any Satanist type of thing here. I think it's just a matter of no. There's it's literally nothing. trickery, you, guys. It's that, just that playing and having fun. Oh, yeah. I think it's got to be a joke. There's nothing. There's nothing satanic about any of this. Yes, and Daniel um, Kahneman is a fantastic source for um, looking into how we react, thinking fast and slow. There's also a lot of psychology where we decide things and then we spend the rest of our time coming up with why we decided to do such and such. And I know that that's very important with hypnosis as well, because you get people like, if you tell somebody um, you're going to take off your shirt because it's hot in here. Later on, you'll say you were hypnotized. No, I wasn't. Then why is your shirt off? Well, it, I just didn't, I don't like my shirt. It was hot in here. <laughs> Am I incorrect in that? That we have a tendency to cover up why yeah, we, we, we backwards things. justify. We of course we do that. We but this is also the reason. By the way, little dating advice here, one hundred and one with Spidey and Eric. Um, it's also the reason why sometimes we feel very attracted towards people that 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 they're nothing because we backwards justify why we invested that much time in them. Mm. Does yeah. that make sense? You sure. you pursue someone for months, and people around you are telling you he's he's 
you, he's bad for you. And you go, yeah, but I love him. We have this connection. You don't. That's just your mind not wanting to accept that you wasted that much time in someone. True. They've done a lot of research um, on, so they did, they did a study. The numbers are, I can't remember the numbers, but you guys can look this up and maybe I'll, you know, Eric, or I will find a source, the more specific sources later put in the description. But they did a study where um, I talk about on the channel where they led a bunch of women into a study group about dating and sexuality with no, there was no, um, there was no, they didn't have to jump through hoops. They were just allowed to go in and participate and listen to the seminar. And then another group of women had to go through a very tedious application process to be let in. Now the seminar was purpose, purposely useless. Mm. It gave really no valuable information. And at the end, the people in the room were asked to evaluate how helpful it was. The people who were just let in gave it very low scores, much, much lower because they were like, it was stupid. But those oh, who went through a lot that. to get there gave it a higher score, this, much okay, higher, significantly okay, this higher. Goes, this goes into hazing studies. I know exactly what you're talking about. That, exactly. That's what this is about. Like yes. basic training yep. has a profound influence on everybody who went into it together. 100%. You have tribes in Africa that do things that are really crazy. I'm not going to get into details, but the loyalty to the tribe is so much more powerful you have fraternities and they do, you know, spanking and everything else. And this locks people in and for their life. Yeah. So, so group suffering creates group loyalty. Mm -hmm. And we, and Eric, I think your, I think your mentalism is improving because I gave those exact examples in that video. So again, it's part of my mentalist reacts to the mentalist series. And mm. uh, I talked exact, I said exactly what you said. So that study is exactly the reason there's a light version of that too. And it could be simply like if you're putting in your field, right? If you're putting on a concert and they cover your cost uh, to play at a university, for example, you could put on a free concert, but you'll never want to. You want to at least charge people five bucks or they won't enjoy the show. Yeah. Because they paid to be there. Absolutely. Right. 100% agreed. So going back to what we were saying earlier, which is the reason I went and got this shiny silver half dollar is early on in magic we learn that so you were talking about that casual vibe so tony corinda uh yeah so tony corinda's 13 steps is i don't think i have it here it's in my library upstairs yeah it's it's the it's like the original book of mentalism but again it's all trickery it's not it's actually not my favorite um Practical Mental Effect from Adam and is, is quite a bit better as a basic book, in my opinion. But they're both like the basics of mentalism, but it's trickery. They're going to teach you how to swap things and how to, how to influence things, but not really. Not real psychology. Anyway, so you're talking about the casualness of presentation. So early in yeah. magic, we learn a very basic coin vanish, which is you take the coin, you put the coin in your hand, and the coin is gone. This is this is a class. I'm going to step back yeah. so you guys can see everything here. That's a classic of magic where it just it stays in the other hand. So... When you see amateur magicians do this, they have the tension in the wrong place because their attention is on that coin. They're worried about that coin. Mm -hmm. So as they go to put it in the left hand like this, instead of this right hand casually just dropping like it doesn't matter, you see this kind of tenseness and their own body language is towards here. So you yourself as a spectator go, wait, what, what the hell was that? But as mm -hmm. we learn more and more, we learn that we need to ignore this and put all the focus and attention here. So after that, it's all, all the tension is here. My, I've ignored my right side. I've brought this into view as this naturally drops by my side. And now the coin is gone. And as we get better at it, we learn how to manipulate your attention to know exactly where you're going to look every step and every second and know exactly how to manipulate that mm -hmm. to know exactly where you're looking. So the more you, the more you get comfortable with it, the more you can make it look natural to where even they don't know where that coin is, not in the sleeves. They, they legitimately, you can play around with the perception and it's so much more amazing than that sort of tenseness where it follows the wrong thing. So magic mentalism, we learned very early on to put the tension where we want you to look. There's actually a three steps though, because I could see that going, um, where, okay, you get good and your first tense because of where the coin sits. 
then as you start to get better at that, you learn to put the tension on the other side, but you could over sell the tension on the other side, which could yes. then, you know, overcompensate and, That's a very, very and good then point. you have That's... to maybe back off, yeah. you know, dial it back just enough to where you, I hate to say it's like multi-level fakery, but it kind of is in the no, sense of like, like you, you want to have the tension there, but pretend you're not having the tension there, but that's exactly where you want them to look. Yeah. And a really good, and a really good example of that is the blindfold act. So one of the classics of mentalism that you might see in a lot of different mentalist shows is the blindfold act where the mentalist puts on a blindfold and audience members reach into their pockets or do, you know, write things down. The mentalist knows everything. This is, you're thinking of this and you're thinking of that. They know everything. Now I, I obviously can't tell you the method to that. Sure. Um, but you know, there's all kinds of versions with examined blindfolds and all kinds of stuff. There's stuff where we duct tape our faces completely, but, but suffice it to say that there is obviously a trick behind that. So often a lot of mentalists oversell this. If you want to see one of the best versions of that, my buddy, Eric Dillman was on America's Got Talent. I think, now it's been several years, but you guys can go see Eric Dillman, America's Got Talent. He does one of the best versions of the blindfold act I've ever seen. And it's so good because a lot of mentalists will like oversell it because they'll be blindfolded. And all of a sudden they're like walking into walls purposely. I'm like, oh, uh, where's my pen? Where's my pen? You know, like, like we get it. <laughs> we, get, we get it. You can't see. So oh, I actually like tell my table there. So... You have that overacting where when you do that, it's exactly what you said. The audience goes, okay, well, that's it's a little much. Because if I was blindfolded right now, if you were to blindfold me, I wouldn't desperately be slapping things looking for my pen. There might be a bit of this, you know, or a bit of like I might ask, hey, do you, do you see my pen, by the way? Oh, here? Great, thanks. But I wouldn't have this overselling of like, look, I can't see. Um, and, and often they can't. It's so silly because you actually can't see. Stop pretending. Just don't see. <laughs> right. Like it, it, like you might feel for the pen. It, not yeah. a lot, but just like, kind of yeah. like, you know, if I'm not yeah, looking, like, I, I, yeah. oh, here it is. Yeah. yeah. So that makes and sense. and, and in, in, in reality, you would give up relatively early and ask someone. You Like, it wouldn't be like this. Where's my pen? Where's my pen? Where, it, would be, it would be a lot closer to, Eric, do you see my pen? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like I'm, I would sure. ask for help almost immediately. If it wasn't where I thought it would be, I would say, Eric, is my, do you see my pen? So yeah, often we magicians really overcompensate. And, and do you also ask, sorry to interrupt to get the further participation because you want them to help, you know, help, help to own the trick too. you know, you're giving well, ownership so that, of that. Act. Now we're, you're going right back to Cialdini and we're talking about the commitment principle, which is like, if they're committed to the process, they're committed to the results. So yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, audi as much as you can getting the audience involved creates a connection between you and them. So yeah, I, I I'll ask questions to the entire audience and I'll, you know, like that card thing is done to everyone who's watching. Um, but I love it. I also love it. I love to, to connect with as many people as possible. So it's a fine line between something I'm doing to benefit me and something I'm doing because I genuinely love to connect with people. Okay. Now we're running into an hour and I wanted to um, leave on one last question because I think it's just kind of a, a general interesting idea. You know, you were saying I can't reveal too much. I can't reveal too much. Things like that. Now tell me about the magician's, I don't know if it's a guild or a creed <laughs> or a gentleman's agreement, but I think you understand where I'm going. Yeah, where... there's a guy. There's a guy with a sniper rifle right there, pointing at me, just waiting for me to cross that line to put me down. I, oh, I was looking for the laser dot. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. So, yeah. So, what is this magician's code? Let's talk about that because it applies to mentalists as much as magicians. Sure. It depends who you ask. There are some people, especially, I, I know that there's somebody earlier who commented from Scotland. So in the UK, there's a the magic circle and they are protectors of secrets. They pride themselves on, on, on never revealing secrets. Well, if we're not going to reveal secrets, then how did you learn magic genius? You know what I mean? Like somebody must have told you. So um, there are people out there, magicians out there who have that old thinking of, we only share secrets amongst each other. We only, you know, but who's each other? What what dictates what a magician is? So for me, that's a little complicated. My my theory is this, and I could magicians could think I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Um, my theory is 
It's available to anybody who wants to learn it seriously, not people who are just idly curious. So for me, if you go to my channel, you're going to find tons of free tutorials. Now, I also have products that I put out there mm -hmm. for more serious students. They buy my more advanced work. But you could go on my channel and learn a lot of really, really cool basic stuff and even some advanced stuff that I put out there that you can go out and do for your friends because there's a few ways I do this. I don't have a single video out there. Maybe I have like one or two really silly ones, but I don't have anything out there that's like learn three tricks in 10 seconds. It's not like this in your face TikTok video where as you're scrolling past, you know, dances and cats, you're going to see me. Here's a secret to a trick. I'm not putting it in your face like that. These mm -hmm. videos are 15 minutes to 20 minutes. They're long. It's an exploration. It's a lesson. There's depth. There's history. So it's only for the serious student who wants to learn an actual skill. Yeah, I saw one where you were doing it with the crumpled paper and showing how you were retaining the crumpled piece. Exactly. So that's, one of, that's one of my favorites. It's something you could do at your next party, New Year's Eve party, with a pencil and eight pieces of paper. And it's a wonderful trick where you predict their thoughts and it really seems like you're in their heads. It's a trick. But yeah, we talk about it. We talk about the history. It's a slight switch. So anyone who's serious is going to watch that. But anyone who's just sort of scrolling by looking for quick magic secrets, it's they're not going to find it on my channel. It's too boring. <laughs> so I don't think there's anything wrong with that. A lot of magicians have a problem with that. Like, oh, you're revealing on YouTube. But the way we learn has changed. YouTube is now a source of education. It's the mm -hmm. way people learn things. And by the way, magicians are not the only people who have secrets. Chefs have secrets, gardeners have secrets, mm. um, martial artists have secrets, and any, any artist. course you pay for, they have freaking secrets because that's the biggest deal in the world. You can get 99% of whatever they're doing in the free material and even levels of the course, but they always hold back that one little thing, that one little nugget that actually makes it worthwhile. And it's yeah, we're saving for a rainy day. day. But, but yeah. the bottom line is this, magicians who are getting upset about this sharing of secrets, you have to understand, just because we trade in secrets doesn't mean that we're the only ones with secrets. I was talking to a martial art friend of mine who said, there's YouTube channels out there teaching martial arts and a lot of the dojos are pissed because it's giving away free courses. And it clicked for me, I go, we're not the only uh. ones complaining about this. It's out there. there. And this is just, people have to understand YouTube is the current library. Like when you were young, you go to the library, you could check out a book on magic and you could learn magic. Well, YouTube is just the newer version of that. So I don't have a problem with people teaching magic out there as long as a couple of things. First of all, I never ever teach anyone else's secrets. Everything I teach on my YouTube channel is something that either I developed or is so old that no one is currently mm -hmm. making a living off that material. So it's stuff I've adapted to make them modern, but the, the basis of it is, is so old and I give the history. I'm not teaching anything. I, I'm not a reveal channel. There's a difference between revealing and teaching. I don't reveal tricks that other people are doing. You'll never see me right. put a performance on full ass of a magician and tell you how it's done. I'm not about that at all. I hate revealing. I don't think any magician should reveal, but teaching is a different thing and, I, and I'm all for it. Well, you don't like spoilers. Exactly. <laughs> So on that note, we'll keep it fun for everybody. I'd love to have you back. Anytime. And we were talking about, um, you know, maybe going into a little bit of the manipulation. Like I, I know you have a video with a lost dog type of thing. And I'd love to explore some more of that. And we might do some uh, behavioral analysis. Absolutely, guys. I'd love to be back talking about behavioral analysis, persuasion. I appreciate you guys being here with us today. Everyone have a super happy new year. Um, and yeah. Head over to the channel, pick up a few little things you could do for your for your friends and family. And guys, again, I really appreciate the support on the psychology stuff. So check that out too. Definitely. Links again. Click his name in the description. You'll you'll go right there. Can't miss it.